Hi, I'm John Kachoyan, Literary Manager at Australian Plays, and we're talking today to Emily Collier, the writer of Contest. Hi, Emily, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Not too bad, thank you. So, can you tell us about Contest, uh, how it started and, and how it progressed as a play? Yeah, so um, it started uh, when I was part of the Beeson Writers Program at Malthouse in 2014, I think, um, and Mark Pritchard got me to just to propose a couple of ideas for something to work on. And I had a few and I said, oh, I've been thinking about this idea of like a play that ha that's about netball and women and is, and he was like, hmm, that sounds interesting. So yeah, it had a really long gestation and we started working on it there and then it um, became a, a Malthouse commission. And so I worked really closely with Mark Pritchard on, on the script for a, quite a few years. And then yes, ultimately became an independent theatre project. But yeah, that's how it started. And yeah, it had a really, as I said, long, slow gestation. Yeah. And for you, when you say, I have an idea, is that an image, is that a line, is that a question, a conundrum, how do works pop into your head? Wow, um, in many different ways. Sometimes it is a phrase or a word, and in fact, um, the initial title for this play was, which is what came to mind, was Wing Attack Apocalypse. <laughs> and it was that for a long time until that became such a heavy title that we sort of lifted it away and went with Contest, which felt a little more kind of muscular and uh, nimble. So it was definitely that phrase came into my mind. And I had a real desire to write something, to challenge myself to write something where there would be um, text that would be necessarily accompanied by a physical score that would be created um, by, the, by, the, by the team. So that was like a, a creative challenge for me. And I really wanted to write something that was about women being very physical and not at all sexual on stage. So really kind of getting into the, the physicality of women's bodies and sweating and, you know, muscles and... Um, an effort and it felt like netball was a good fit for all of those things. So there was, a num there was a number of strands that were kind of coalesced into this idea for a play about or inspired or um, driven in some ways by the, the culture of netball too, which I can talk about a lot, why it, why it kind of appealed to me culturally. Yeah. yeah. And so that physical score, is that something, how did you balance, you know, wanting to create that or perhaps suggest that as the writer versus leaving that to be developed in the in the rehearsal room. I'm pretty good at leaving. Th like I, I quite like leaving a lot of space between my text and in, in in any play that I write. I tend to be fairly minimal with any sort of directions. I might kind of give some stage directions, like, um, uh, you know, more, I'm more likely to give a sort of a difficult stage direction yeah. rather than you know be really specific about about sort of um, physicality. So I, I was really happy just to, for me, it was it just took a long time to know what the text should do that. The physical action, so they weren't doing the same thing. Right. Yeah. So in the end, that was a long conversation over many, you know, years. In the end, especially with Mark and then with Prue Clark, the director, about well, the text, if the physical world is very netball-y, then the text shouldn't be too much about netball. And in one moment of the play, it's very, it's, it's, it's the match, and they're doing all that kind of language about playing a match. But the rest of the text is very much more about the other things I was exploring about female friendship and competitiveness and non-competitiveness. So. Yeah, I guess to answer your question, I was very happy just to lay the text down and then the, the entire physical side of it was developed on the floor in the room with Prue and Nat Curcio and Alice Dixon, the movement um, coordinators and, and the, the cast. So I, I had input, but not a lot. And we were talking just before we started filming about netball being maybe a, a base experience for a lot of Australian women, certainly. And, and is that your experience of, of netball? Do you still play and did you play? Yeah, I played as a kid and actually really liked it. I was not that good at it, but it's one of the things like I enjoyed being part of a team and, you know, and the girls who were really good, I was just like in awe of and I would just like get in there and do my little job. Um, yeah, so I have fond memories of it. I know a lot of people hate it and, you know, there is this sort of thing of the netball bitches and it can be a really kind of competitive bitchy sport or being forced to play it, of course, if you don't like sport at all is, is no fun. Um, but yeah, something about it, I love, I love watching it. I don't play anymore, I haven't for a long time, um, just by circumstance really. And then the other thing that happened, um, my current partner, we've been together 14 years, when I met him, his daughter Molly, my stepdaughter, was playing netball and she was nine at the time. So I kind of re-entered this world as an adult of the kids sporting and it kind of brought up all these memories, good and weird for me, a bit like stepping back into the school arena. So yeah, it had a lot of potency for me as an adult in, in memory of what it meant to me as a child. Yeah, and I suppose there's a, there's a hierarchy to sport or there's a series of rules involved in sport that we don't often question 
in terms of what we value and how we value it. Do you think that's something that we've sort of inherited from sport in general in the country? Ooh, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Australia is so driven by, yeah, like, you know, it, it is a sporting culture. I think it's a culture that values um, youth and vitality and energy and strength and competitiveness and, and winning, you know, and that, that can be for good or bad. I think I'm often pushing against that as an artist and saying, hang on, there's, there's more nuance, there's other ways to see the world. But I also love watching some sports so I mean I have enough of that in me that I get excited too about um, displays of physical mm. dexterity and, and especially team sports I think there's something really emotional about team sports which is a great cathartic experience and and again we talked a lot about this in the development of the play can a, can a piece of theatre capture the same thing as live sport and I don't think it can because the whole point of live sport is you don't know the outcome and that's what's so thrilling about it and theatre, even if you're pretending not to know the outcome, it's it's a conceit. So again, we when I was developing the play, it was like, okay, we're not trying to re we're not trying to recreate a netball match, which I'm trying to dig into all the stuff around what it means to be part of a team. Um, and especially in the end, we decided an amateur team was more interesting than a professional team, for lots of reasons. Yeah, and, and I suppose one of those reasons is it gives you. Uh, access to a wide variety of bodies and, and experiences and characters. Can you talk about the, the kind of makeup of the team, as it were? Has that always been the same? Who's played what position and how, how did that form for you? Uh, no, it, it changed and evolved quite a bit. So a very early development I had at, um, through uh, City of Yarra funding at, out at Richmond, we had a team that was a team of actors that was more, um, had more diversity in terms of age. There were probably, I don't think there were probably three or four in their 20s, a couple in their 30s, in their 40s, and then one, um, yeah, so it was more sort of diverse that way, but it had more of a focus on that kind of feisty, youthful, sort of grunty energy. And then as the play evolved, again, through conversations with Mark and, and me just digging into what I was really exploring, we thought, okay, let's, we, let's shift it up. We really wanted to look at older bodies mm. on stage, so women, um, you know, with, with a bit more life under their belt and who maybe you wouldn't normally see being so physical on stage because normally highly physical bodies on stage you associate with dance and they're nearly always young. Um, so yeah, we thought, okay, this is interesting to take it older in terms of what we see but also the energy of what they're bringing and the content of the play started to be about a lot about endurance, um, you know, as a woman, as a human. So that started to feed in and then yeah, we, we, we gathered the final sort of team of five um, as, as, as I prepped for that, for the actual production that went on at Northcote, yeah. Um, we had a great development at Malthouse just before that and just one cast member swapped out who couldn't do the final one, but we ended up with a great team, yeah. yeah. And so in terms of this, this is a really interesting, I was looking through production shots and some, some of the videos because um, I didn't see the production. And so it's really interesting to note that there's a kind of sense of uh, scale and epicness that maybe isn't evident from the, a first read of the script, or that certainly was uh, pulled out by the production, mm. that scale, that apocalypse, mm. has that always been part of the work, the kind of boldness and, and grandeur of something that seems so everyday mm. and moves somewhere quite epic? Yeah, we definitely, that for me was always at the heart of the piece, and I, and I do that a lot with my work, I suppose, is you start in a fairly ordinary world, but definitely take it somewhere else. You know, I want, I want works to kind of be, have, have a transporting and transformative element to them. So yeah, that, that was definitely there and, and you know, getting the right team of creatives around to, to realise that was, was super important. Um, and then of course that they bring their own epicness so it kind of becomes even more than what I, what I had imagined. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and what, what do you think your, do you think your focus or what the work, you know, is kind of doing has changed because you were writing it for, you know, a couple of years, certainly at least. What do you think stayed the same and what do you think changed? Or what interests you in it? Um, oh, I, th I think that, I think that sort of deeping and really digging, it, digging into notions of, um, especially some questions around illness, ageing and disability, they kind of came in a bit later for many reasons. Um, one being that I, I went through my cancer diagnosis while I was mid-developing mid this play. So I suddenly was like, had, you know, a breast cancer diagnosis and was undergoing chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So that, of course, fed in because suddenly the play felt real in a whole lot of different ways about a different notion, notion of endurance and survival. 
Um, and then also, it was actually Mark Pritchard had the, I think, genius decision to, um, to invite Kate Hood into the team, who's a wheelchair user and disabled actor. Um, and we thought, oh, that, that's so exciting to bring another kind of body into this space and another kind of actor's energy. So, and that, so it became very deliberately about trying to mess with those expectations about what, a, what an able body is or what a disabled body is and what it can do. And then we also became very interested in the role of um, Cassandra, who's the only one with a name. The others are all just known by their positions. Uh, so she's wing attack and she brings the apocalypse. Um, that, that she had this underlying sense of a chronic illness or something invisible, but that was like the fire inside of her. So all of that emerged later in the development and, and for those reasons I just articulated. Yeah. Yeah. And so structurally, rhythmically, the work is, is uh, a series of kind of sometimes um, quotidian vignettes punctuated by this extraordinary landscapes of, of monologues and interiors. And, and has that, that rhythm and that pattern been part of the work? from its conception and how do you juggle making rhythm that way as a writer? Yeah, that, that again took a long time to to get the balance, I won't even use the word right because who knows <laughs> if it's right, but get the balance that it now is. Um, I mean, I think I always have those tendencies because um, like yourself, I write poetry, so I, I have that sort of poetic tendency which I love to explore, but that's, you know, that's very different from dramatic writing. So I mean, this was a very deliberate experiment to try and put those two together to have scenes that were like real scenes and really driven by a kind of character relationship interspersed with these sort of, as you said, these kind of internal moments where, um, where the characters are expressing something unutterable but, um, but trying to find a language for that and that's why poetry seemed like the best language because it was about sort of pure emotion as opposed to an intellectualization. So again, that, that just sort of, that, that developed slowly. I mean, with this script, it never, it took a long time to find the structure. Like I didn't start with the kind of story that I wanted to tell. It was like I was playing with language for months and months, just like kind of, you know, writing little sort of back and forth vignettes or all or, or those sort of things that ended up more as monologues and just trying to find my way into the muscularity of the language. So it just took a lot of experimenting and a lot got discarded. Like there's more than probably any other play I've written, there's reams that didn't make it into the final cut. And there's a, there's a whole other version of the play um, that is more like an early version where it's sort of more about it's set at the end of the world and it's this team of young women and they're fighting for the survival of the human race and it was a bit more sci-fi and I have a great fondness for that version too and in fact just before just before we started rehearsal for this one I panicked and thought have I done the right version and gathered Prue and some other actors to have a reading of that version which I still love but it felt like this one had become more true to what the work was about. Mm. So. And maybe where you were and what you were yes. kind of grappling yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. So that was like a, a, a stepping stone on the way to, yeah. to this one. Yeah. Do you think, I suppose it's a question I kind of come across a lot and I don't know the answer to, which is do you think poetry or lyricism on stage is, is undramatic, is fundamentally sort of anti-dramatic or, or is it just about how it's treated or how it's perceived? Wow, um, that's a very good question. I think, I think, I think the same. I think the same pressures needn't be put on on poetic text as on dramatic text. I think a poetic text can be dramatic, if yes, as you say, if it's served in a particular way by by how it emerges from that performance text, from what the actors are doing, from from the context. And certainly with this one, you know, we found during rehearsal it was very important for the actors to know where where their moments of poetry came from, in the history of that character, but also in their from their body. So I think it, and so we, we felt it could only work if the pressure of the physicality and they, you know, the actors really worked it in this, like they, if you didn't see it, but like every night they, they fully went hell for leather. So they were exhausted, they were sweating, they were struggling for breath. So when these things came out, it was like a, it was like a sort of a moment of survival. So I guess in that, for this play, that was how we, we dealt with that issue of the two texts sitting side by side and still being part of the one world. Mm. Yeah, sort of a, a need gets yes. generated for that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's really, really interesting. Yeah. And I suppose also because, I mean, the, the other big thing to talk about in the work is that it is a work that grapples with, uh, with gender in the sense that anything has to, but, but it is a, a group of women um, and it is a, was a show created by a team of women as well. Um, do you think that's something that you're, is it, was it interesting to try and grapple with something so large as a kind of idea in the play? I mean, obviously you've focused it through contest and through things like that but was that I suppose that's I suppose what I'm asking is like something that's essentially could be a theme of anything that anyone ever writes 
how do you manage that scale within work? Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it, it was <clears throat> it was a deliberate choice. To, obviously, the cast is all, all women, but it was then a very deliberate choice to say, Let, let's have a creative and production team that is all women as well, just sort of for the, and for the scale of it. And I mean, I know that's, it's not completely uncommon, but it's mm. probably less common than it could be. Um, so that was part of the ambition. Um, yeah, and then I guess once 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 I'm actually making a once we're making the work, I try not to think too much about the, those high level questions, which hopefully I've answered as I've developed the text. So they're all sitting in there and sitting around it. But then it just becomes about how do we realise this? Yeah. How do you actually just make it work for these bodies in this space and an audience will be watching and these are the restrictions we have and that for me helps you become very focused on the mechanics. Yeah. How will it work? Yeah. That line doesn't make sense anymore. This one can, you don't get it yet, but it will, trust me. So all of those sort of things, it becomes very much about the, yeah, the actual working of the text and I sort of try and let some of the those bigger picture things sit to the side otherwise it's too it's too too much pressure or too overwhelming to think oh we're serving all these big themes yeah, yeah and that, that trick of knowing um what the scaffolding you're building can hold you know it, it can't be everything or it can't necessarily mm. hold every every weight oh that yeah you might have. yeah and it's 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 you know heartbreaking is a strong word but you, you've got to let go of so much stuff because yes it can't it can't serve every single person it can't answer all questions about gender ever so, you know, it was really focusing in dramaturgically and then once Prue, the director, came on board directorially on what are the really key questions here and identifying that as a team all together. And, you know, one of the, ma one of the main things for us all was, was a shift, was a fairly simple shift from a, a highly competitive relationship between these women through a transition to something a little more soft and caring and, and kind of odd in a way like it ends in quite a strange space but I think a beautiful space um so yeah we, we kind of just refined it down to the the sort of arc like that yeah. and that helped it with that scaffolding question I think there was that's what I sort of that's what resonated with me about that ending the the, the hopefulness and the quietness of uh that trauma or team activity or triumph or adversity can be unifying and can be kind of equalizing and mm. and um that's maybe a rarer story than you would think we see on our stages. I think that's really, it was really interesting to kind of read. What, what was, um, in terms of the production itself, what, is there a moment that surprised you the most about how it worked or, you know, that, that got you, that surprised you as even the, as the writer? Well, I was, while you were talking there, I was just, you know, recalling the play because it's been a while now. But I, I was ever hopeful that... So one thing that was always in the play all the way through was the moment where Cassandra lies down. So that was like, I just knew it had to be there at some point. We didn't know how we would treat it or how we would get there. Um, but so it was this moment after they've, you know, done their warm-up and their training and they're playing this kind of really brutal game which is about each other but about the world in general and she just opts out and lies down. And then the rest of them kind of think something's wrong and get really angry at her, but then they all one by one lie down. And for me, oh, for me it was always, um, it was always a surprise to me how moving I ended up finding that moment and audiences too. Like I, night after night, I could feel and hear and people would come up to me after and say, oh, I started crying in that bit because we just never do that, do we? We just never all stop and lie down. So it was a lovely moment for me of like, oh, that's that my, my hope for, for a theatrical device that would also capture the kind of metaphoric world of the play and have resonance for the people watching it. Um, yeah, it was, it was really gratifying and surprising that that kind of had so much potency because it was quite simple actually, but it seemed to be really like a fulcrum moment. Yeah, and that's the, that's the aim, isn't it? To find that, that moment that is yeah. all those things on, on stage. I think what I loved about that moment certainly in the text too is just that idea of we we can choose to participate differently. We we don't have to be subject to a series of, um, and I imagine, you know, certainly competition amongst men is, is sort of structured in a certain way, and I imagine competition among women is kind of structured in a certain way. And so being able to say actually I'm going to sit literally sit out of that mm. structure for a while mm. um, can be really really powerful. It's really, really interesting. And in your work since contest, have you tried? Uh, is there anything that you sort of, kind of lessons or just interests, little strands that you're still kind of grappling with with that work, or do you feel like you have put some of you know kind of contest to bed essentially? Um, 
Yeah, it's hard to say with a big work like that. In some ways, it's a culmination of what came before. Like I feel like a lot of works led to that moment, but certainly it, it, it leads to other things. I mean, I'm, I remain ever, ever more interested, I suppose, in, in kind of a cross-disciplinary approach to writing performance texts. And, and, you know, and yeah, always kind of trying to circle through dramatic and poetic and theatrical and naturalism and, and non-naturalism. And so that, that feels like that's, that's a consistent fascination of mine in that I learned a lot from Contest about how that can work and how it doesn't. So yeah, that, and then that feels like it feeds into to things that I'm developing um, and looking to develop in the future. And in fact, I, you know, whether I get in or not, I've just applied to do a PhD at RMIT in creative writing and in cross-form writing. So really looking very closely at what it means to bring different forms into conversation with each other. So I guess it really has kind of taken a hold in me of what fascinates me about particular kinds of work, yeah. Yeah, because we've talked, um, uh, everyone should read Emily's fantastic state of play essay, which will be out by the time you're watching this video. Um, we've talked a lot in our previous conversations about kind of what your other practice mm. gives you and what the longevity of that practice gives you. Um, can you talk briefly to that? I mean, people should definitely read the essay, but um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really interested in that as an aspect of your work that I, mm. it seems inexorably linked to the fact that you you don't just write plays. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard to sort of tease out how much is uh, sort of conscious and how much is circumstance. I mean, I guess I, I, came, to, I came to playwriting actually through acting, as many of us do. Uh, and then that sort of, I guess because I've just always had an interest in, in writing and a facility with words, that sort of led to other things. And I, I do find that some I. I guess it's that obvious thing, some ideas are best expressed in different forms. You know, there's a particular thing about the liveness of a play and of theatre that, that suits certain kinds of um, explorations. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's a way of understanding or seeking clarity about the world that, that suits poetry or that poetry can answer in a better way. Mm. Um, I also love, you know, I love my non-fiction writing, which is more probably me presenting arguments to the world. Mm. Like this is like, hey, I've noticed this thing and I think we need to talk about it or, or more of a personal kind of reflection. So, yeah, I, I think I used to used to worry about it more or, I mean, I think it can be, thinking, oh, you're meant to be an expert in one thing and I do think we live in a culture that tends to favour that, mm. like the person who is really, really good at writing, you know, just science fiction yeah. some things. But I think, you know, as an artist and as we're all creators, we're all creative beings, I think there's something really interesting about having that sort of multiplicity and moving between that. And yeah, part of it's logistical too. Like it, if you're trying to make a living, you need to be able, you need to have many different, you know, strings yeah. to your bow. But I think creatively, it's really interesting. It kind of yeah. keeps you quite alive. I suppose I'm also, f I find it fascinated with the, just the sheer difference in the kind of experience of time. You know, a poem to me is a burst or a, you know, it's a moment, it's an attempt to kind of pin down a, something quite small. And so the, there's something extraordinary about the interest and drive and energy required to write a play. I'm always in awe of playwrights for, for that precise reason that, that there's something that's sustaining an hour, two hours worth of time and mm. to years of thought. And I always find that, how do you, do you just have a sort of internal radar about the scale of ideas or is it really about having to kind of explode them to their biggest or smallest point and see what they are afterwards. I've got a bit of an internal radar. Yeah, I mean, I think p things will sort of come to me. It's like, oh, I'm pretty sure this is a, this is a play. Mm. This one's a poem. This one's a, a you know, short story. Um, but having said that, then it's a matter of like working, working the idea, like I say, really hard to kind of find its, to find its boundaries or sort of push beyond those. And, and things will occasionally change, will occasionally change form, not terribly often, but sometimes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm. that's I, I don't know how anyone does it. <laughs> um, I think that's pretty. That's a pretty good conversation. Yeah. Is there anything else you kind of want to say about the work, or anything else that kind of interests you that um, I haven't mentioned? Um, I mean, I guess one thing we sort of did cover it in terms of the casting, but you know, re really important to the work was was an experiment in inclusive rehearsal room practice. Mm. Um, so we, we worked really hard to. You know, have, having Kate on board, who um, who was a fantastic disability advocate as well as a fantastic actor, and she taught us so much about what it means to set up a space. That's that means she can be in a room with able-bodied actors, and that can work. And you know, I felt really proud of us doing that as an independent production because we had 
as we always do, really limited resources, but to do that and to really pay attention. You know, we had um, Alice Ansara who was breastfeeding and had a small child at the time and Emily Tomlins had an injured shoulder. And so everyone, the play in some ways, the process was a bit of a reflection of the content of the play, which was how can we care for each other? How can we actually create spaces that allow for difference, but also form a kind of unity? So I suppose I like to, I like to bring that up because I feel like, you know, independent theatre often carries loads that aren't acknowledged. There's the actual work, but there's all the, everything that goes on around to build these little communities every time. And that's always about the skills and the generosity of the people involved. So for me, like Contest was so much about that group of women, people who came together, all, you know, hands on heart to try and make this work. And it was difficult at times, it was really hard, but it was also incredibly rewarding for us as a group to sort of see what we could and couldn't do in that context. So I feel like that's inextricably linked to what the work became, is that group of people and what we wanted to do, yeah. Yeah, and that challenge of questioning just these like unspoken structures that underpin how we all work, which are, yeah. which are sort of essentially exploitative and time intensive and inherited from kind of a Western British rep. Mm. You know, we will all rehearse for this much time during these hours in this sort of way. and. Mm. Um, and then somehow expecting the product to be, to not have been affected by that process mm. is, is really interesting. Do you have, how much input do you have as a writer in structuring process, in, in terms of rehearsal process? Well, I, I certainly prefer it when I have a really close working relationship with the director that I'm working, you know, I, I kind of choose my, choose my projects and, and form those relationships carefully because I, I do like to be, quite involved to a point and then not at all. I mean, you know, I certainly respect the director's process and I'm, I and I'm not someone who likes to direct my own work at all. So I, I love kind of letting go of a lot of that control. But yeah, I think there's, I think for me, there's something really important about having a good conversation and a good understanding early on that means I, I feel like it's in safe hands and, um, and that I can have input and that, that input is welcomed. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's the director's decision about how things go. But and I've always felt that with the great directors I've worked with, and it's always, say, with Prue, it's incredibly respectful and um, and a great reciprocal relationship. And often, you know, she would actually she would turn to me or or ask my opinion about how something was panning out. And if I had a strong opinion, I would say. And if I didn't, I would go, well, it's it's up to you. You know, you're doing a great <laughs> job. <laughs> yeah. It's nice sometimes as a director to be able to have people to turn to as well, because there's a sort of assumption that the everyone looks at you and you don't necessarily have somewhere to, to look. And so yeah. I think those true collaborations are, are beautiful for that reason when you can turn to yours, turn sideways essentially and say to someone, is this help? <laughs> you know, is this any good? You yeah. know? Yeah. And I think too, I mean, another thing about indie theatre is you would know when, you, when you're the, the, the progenitor of the project, I feel like it's your responsibility to hold the project too. So like I wrote the play and then I went, well, I want to get this thing on because, you know, and I, so it then became my responsibility to build that team and to be the person that anyone could turn to if they needed to and then step out creatively so they could do their work. But it's like, well, yeah, I want this thing to happen so I have to kind of, yeah, hold the space for it. I think that's a really interesting skill for a playwright. I remember working with Ben Ellis on my first, very first play in London and Ben came and saw week three of rehearsal, which was, you know, the worst week. And I'm sure he was panicked, but he was very calm and sort of said, you know, Sorry, I came today essentially, and he <laughs> and he wandered off. And I always thought the kind of um, the care and attention of having been working with someone who was more experienced than I was, knowing that knowing when to leave and when mm. to come. And I think as a writer, that must be an interesting skill to develop and navigate, just mm. knowing knowing when you're needed versus what's your need. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, and to you know, actors have an amazing process. I mean, I just I just adore actors, but they often can't do that fully and freely if they know the writer's sitting there. <laughs> Especially if they're people that you like, they, you know, either friends or, you know, peers that you have an enormous amount of respect for and vice versa. So, but they need to be able to wrestle with the material and to be able to do that in a way that doesn't feel like they're dissing me if I'm sitting in the corner going, ah, you know, so, but again, again, that, that kind of sometimes in to help, sometimes out so they can thrash it out, yeah. yeah and that difference between kind of uh, the playwright's answers and the play's answers, you know, Ooh. the thing we're making versus yeah. The kind of sage in the corner, or it's so interesting, yes, because sometimes it'd be like, just tell us, just tell us what this bit means. And it's like, well, I can tell you what I think it means, but I think you'll find out what it means. Mm. And I guess that's the thing about my text, and particularly this one, it's a very open offer. 
like there's so many ways all of the scenes could have gone. So it, yeah, it takes the team to really sort of work that out. Yeah, yeah. I'm quite fascinated. A discussion we've had along a series of Red Doors has been with writers whose work are, is more open or, um, you know, uh, amorphous than you might sort of a very traditional idea of a play text. And so handing these works on and hoping for second, you know, third and 50th productions mm. is, is really fascinating. Is there anything you're particularly curious about in, in the sort of next version of context removed from that original production? Yeah, I mean, I, I would love to see another production just because I think it would be completely different because the energy of that group of people is what made that show, you know, from the actual sort of choreography down to just the decisions around the, the tone of the piece. So, um, yeah, I'd really love to see a, another production. I have tried to keep the script open, like it is five figures, mm. um, but I think you could, you could play it with more or probably not too many less, but you could play it with more and go for more of a kind of a choral sort of structure. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I hope that that, I hope that there's enough in there that would be of interest to another team at some point. But you know, that that's yeah. And there's an encouragement in your script to to continue to potentially you know offer the broadest offer for bodies to mm. be cast as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. And I want that. That's very consciously part of you know the provocation of the plays. You know, if if that if possible, find find a, an actor in a wheelchair. And uh, to play the role that Kate did, because that role was built with her and around her. And if if that's not possible, that's also fine, and the script can work without it. But it's just so people are conscious and going, oh yeah, what kind of bodies do we normally cast, and why can't we cast our net a little wider? Yeah, and what are our basic assumptions mm. behind what a performer is or yeah. can do? Or yeah. yeah, it's fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us thank today. Thank you. We tighten up, start to push, stop getting turnovers, stop getting opportunities, stop making them pay. When your house is on fire, you can only ignore it for so long. I stopped. I looked. And when I did, it all came flooding. Where are they? They can drive a truck through that gap for fuck's sake! It's all right! It's all right! We're all right! Stay there, girls! Come on! We're down. Not just down, but floundering. Passes going nowhere. Their bodies everywhere. They're in front every time. What's she doing? Is she okay? Injury? Fuck! Twist her ankle. Pull her hammy. Sprain her wrist. Bend her finger back. Wall to the head. Whacked in the face. Trip and fall. Break her knee. Wrench her hip. Cops the 